According to uh, Sahih Bukhari 2662, you cannot praise a person in front of him. Okay. And is Friday bath compulsory? Yes, according to Hadith 2665 of Sahih Bukhari, it is compulsory. Today we will study from the book Masnande Imam Ahmad. Hadith number 336. Read this. It was narrated that Umar said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, we are not to be inherited from. What we leave behind is charity. So if I have a prophet leave anything, that will be considered as charity. It won't be given to his family, his children. <clears throat> no need to write any question from this one. Read the next one. It was narrated that Malik bin Auf said, Umar radiallahu and sent for me and he mentioned a similar hadith. He said the wealth of Banu Nadir was among the five that Allah granted to his messenger for which the Muslim made no expedition with either cavalry or camel. He allocated some of it for his family's maintenance for one year. And what was left he spent on horses and weapons in preparation for jihad for the sake of Allah. He be glorified and exalted. So oh, this is a booty from another expedition and how it was spent. No need to write any question for this. <clears throat> <clears throat> next, read the next one as well. It was narrated from Asim bin Umar from his father that the Prophet wasallam said, when night comes and day departs and the sun set, the fasting person, person may break his fast. So this is a common thing among Muslims. Alhamdulillah. So we, you know, when it sun sets, we break our fast, whether it is Ramzan fast or whether it is any other optional fast. So if anyone asks you why, we break fast at sunset. The answer is this and this. <clears throat> when night comes and the day departs and the sun sets, the fasting person may break his fast. That is the reason why we break our fast at the sunset time. No need to write any question. This is a common knowledge. Proceed to the next one. It was narrated that Ibn Abbas said, I wanted to ask Umar something, but I did not find a chance. So I waited for two years. Then we, when we were in Maraz Zahran, he went to relieve himself. Then he came after relieving himself and I poured water for him. I said, oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, who are the two women who help one another against the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, Aisha and Hafsa. Read this footnote as well. As mentioned in the Quran, if two, if you two wives of Prophet wasallam turn in repentance to Allah, it will be better for you. Your hearts are indeed so inclined to oppose what the Prophet wasallam likes. But if you help one another against him, Muhammad wasallam, then verily, Allah is his Mola, Lord or Master or Protector. And Jibril and the righteous among the believers, and furthermore, the angels are, are his helpers. So, basically, what happened that Prophet had more than one wife. So, with one wife, uh, he probably used to eat something, or I don't remember the exact thing, but these two wives decided to make the Prophet feel 
that she is not good, something like this. So when Prophet ﷺ came from that wife, these two wives said, uh, smell is coming from your mouth or something like this. Basically, Prophet ﷺ had eaten honey in her house. So they were ridiculing the honey that he ate there. So at that time, this chronic ayah was revealed. No need to write any questions from this one as well. <clears throat> Next, Ms. Hoor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It was narrated from Ibn Sirin, who heard it from Abu Abu Al Ajfa, who said, "I hear Umar, Rasulullah say, do not make women's dories too expensive for it. For if it were a sign of honor in this world or a sign." of pity in the hereafter the most likely of you do not if would have been the prophet ﷺ, but he did not give any of his daughter in marriage any of his daughter in marriage or marry any of his wives for more than 12 12 okia. Furthermore, you say during your companions, so and so was killed as a martyr. So and so died as a as a mounts back with gold and silver, hoping to do trade. So do not say that. Rather say as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever died dead for the sake of Allah is in paradise. So here we have two things. First thing is for the women that they should not ask too much dowry. It is also known as mahar at the time of marriage. They should they can, Islam allows them to ask whatever they want, but they should not make it too expensive or too difficult for the husband. So they should keep it easy for their husband. This is the first thing. <clears throat> and the second thing in this hadith is this, and we don't know the reality of any person. Sometimes you may feel a person very good, but in reality he is in hellfire. And sometimes you may feel a person is bad, but in reality, he will be in paradise. So anything can happen. You can't be sure about anyone. Next, Miss Muhammad. It was narrated from Madan bin Abi Talha al Yamari that Umar stood up to deliver a khutbah. He praised and glorified Allah. Then he mentioned the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, then he said, I have seen a dream in which I saw myself being pecked by a rooster twice. And I think it signals my death. The people are telling me to appoint a khalif after me. Allah will not cause his khalifate or his religion to be lost or that with which he sent his prophet. If I die, then the caliphate is to be is to be decided by a council of these six men with whom the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was pleased when he died. Then whichever of them you swear allegiance to, listen to him and obey. I know that there are some men who will seek to undermine this matter and I have fought them with these two hands of mine in support of Islam. If they do that, then those are the enemies of Allah, the misguided disbelievers. By Allah, I am not leaving behind anything of more concern to me than Qalala. I asked the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about it, and he never spoke to me in such a harsh manner. 
as he did with regard to that, to such an extent that he poked me in the chest or side with all oh, rumor. The verse at the end of Surah and Nisa that was revealed in summer is sufficient for you. If I leave, I will pass a judgment concerning it that no one who reads Quran or who does not read Quran will dispute. Then Umar said, O oh Allah, bear witness concerning the governors of regions. I send them to teach the people their religion and the sunnah of their prophet and to divide the fire among them and to judge between them on a fair basis. And whatever they found difficult, they were to refer to me. Then he said, O oh people, you eat two plants that I think are nothing but distressful, this garlic and onion. At the time of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I will see that if the smell of these things was, was found on a man, he will be taken by the hand and led out to al-Baqi. Whoever must eat them, let him cook them to death. Umar, Umar radiallahu anha said, this is an khutbah on Friday and was stabbed on Wednesday 26th Dhul Hijjah. So the first hadith, or uh, first thing in this hadith is the dream in which he saw that he is being pecked by a rooster twice. So another hadith uh, tells us that he it was uh, narrated as or it was interpreted as uh, a non-Arab person will assassin him. So that thing happened after a few days. He was uh, killed by a Persian man. He was assassinated by a Persian man. Umar Zialanu, who was the second Khalifa, was assassinated by a Persian man. So before his assassination, he saw this dream and he knew already that soon he will be assassinated by a non-other person. So exactly that thing happened according to his dream. Then, and second thing in this hadith is that there is no kingship in Islam. In Islam, the best person is made the leader of the Muslims. In kingship, only members from one family rule the Muslim. That is not in Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. In Islam, the person who is considered as the best person is allowed to lead the person, lead the Muslim. In this case, they made a committee of, I think, six persons. Yes, six persons who decided the next Khalifa of Muslims. So there is no kingship in Islam. Then the last thing is that we cannot go to the mosque after eating uncooked onion and garlic. So if you want to eat onion and garlic, you better cook them to kill their smell. Then you can eat them. We can write a question for this one. Can we go to mosque? After eating uncooked onion or garlic so in the answer you can write according to hadith 341 of Masnaya Masnade Imam Ahmad no we cannot I will repeat the answer according to Hadith 341 of Masnad Imam Ahmad. No, we cannot. Ms. Hoor, repeat the question and the answer. 
can we go to mosque after eating uncooked onion or garlic according to hadith 341 masnad imad imam ahmad no we cannot now read the next one It was narrated from Abu Musa that Umar Rasulullah said it, it was the sunnah of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu in Hajj, but I am afraid that they will have intimate relation with them, their wives beneath the uh, Iraq trees, then they will bring them for Hajj. So this will be discussed in detail in the Hajj Hadith. Here we have only one Hadith, so no need to write any question, but we will study them in detail in the Hajj chapter, inshallah. Okay, next Hadith is important for those who live in cold areas. Mr. Muhammad, in the next one. It was directed that Umar radiallahu anha said, I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing wudu after relieving himself and wiping over his leather slippers hoof, then praying. In the winter, Sahih. when you make wudu, do you wash your mm -hmm. feet or you just wipe over your leather slippers or socks? I have like a small towel. I just wipe it. So, for how many days you do this without washing the feet? No, not for how many days. Because if sometimes you go to the toilet, then you have to do another do again. Yeah. So, here we will write the question. What is the ruling for wiping wiping our the leather socks instead of washing feet during the wudu. There are many hadiths regarding this. Here we have only one hadith. So when you will study all these hadiths in detail, I will tell you the practical example inshallah. For example, you wake up in the Fajr Salah or maybe let's make it Zohar because in the Zohar the weather is better. Fajr it is very cold. So let's suppose it is Zohar Salah. <clears throat> in Zohar Salah you made Wudu and you washed your feet as well. Okay. After washing feet, you made well, you made wudu in which you wash your feet. Then you put on the leather socks or any socks, just say socks, you put something permanently over it. Then as long as you are wearing these socks, even if you break your wudu, and even if you make a new wudu, it is not necessary to wash your feet. Just pass wet hands over your socks. And you can do it 
for maximum 24 hours. After 24 hours, when you will make the wudu, you need to wash your feet. Did you understand the concept? Oh, so even when you go to the toilet, everything is fine. Yes, as long as you don't remove these chalks. Once you remove them, then for the wudu, you need to wash your feet. If you don't remove them, then for next 24 hours, you don't need to wash your feet. So is, does it have to be specific only leather or any socks you can wear? No, there is a disagreement here. For example, this word Khufaihi. Khuf, I personally think it is only for leather socks. But some say it's for simple socks as well. I personally believe it is for only leather socks okay like this one this one this one but some people say no it is for simple as well so there's a disagreement on this i personally consider it only for leathers